buddy. It's time to get up. It's time to get up. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Whether you're a biological mom, an adoptive mom, a foster mom, a mom-to-be, maybe you're a woman who longs to be a mother, or you're a grieving mom, or maybe you're a grandmother, or a spiritual mom. We are so grateful for you, for your strength of character and the way that you nurture and care for us each and every day. We are a stronger community because of you. I think it'd be very appropriate if we celebrated our moms by sharing in the chat box what we appreciate about them. Let us know why you love your mom. And speaking of community, it's not too late to invite someone to church. If you're watching by Facebook, all you have to do is click on the share button. And if you're watching via our website, simply copy and paste it into a text message or into an email. But for all of us, we want you to participate and engage today. So maybe you continue the conversation in the chat box about your mom or about something Joel says, or maybe you fill out an online connection card and let us know about specific prayer requests you have or ways that we can help meet your physical needs. Or maybe you're, you participate in online giving. Because right now we really need each other for encouragement and support. And that's why we're so glad that you joined us today. Thank you so much. Now let's continue to encourage one another through worship. So as Joy mentioned, I do want to wish all of our mothers a happy Mother's Day. We're so grateful for you. And I especially want to wish one particular mom a happy Mother's Day. That's right, my mom. Her name is Mary. Mom, I love you. Thank you so much for your undying love, all the sacrifices you've made over the years. So grateful for this. I hope you're listening. In fact, if you're not listening, it's a little disappointing, to be honest with you, because you're my mom. But nonetheless, uh, I'll call you later. Happy Mom's Day. You have made a profound difference in my life. God has used you to change my life. And so I love you very much. Well, today we're going to wrap up our series, Unbelievable. We've been talking really about faith. And today's message is called Unbelievable Transformation. This message is really all about change. And what I want you to know is that the world has a lot to say, a lot of ideas about self-improvement and personal transformation. Their world would say, buy some new clothes or whiten your teeth or get a new haircut. All of us need that probably right now. Or they would say, maybe change uh, careers or change locations, get some new friends, you know, uh, get a, go on a diet, uh, start working out, you know, all these kinds of things. And it's not that those things are, are wrong, but they're just external changes. And the Christian life is really about not just external change, but internal total change. This is the work that God wants to do in your life and in my life. But here's the thing the Bible also says is that we can't change ourselves. Yes, with some discipline and uh, accountability, we can adjust our behavior and, and we can live a little bit differently. But I'm talking about who we are can't be changed by just self-effort, right? And so Jeremiah 17, 9 says it clearly. 
The heart is deceitful above all things and, listen to this, beyond cure. It's beyond cure. Who can understand it? I know that's not very hopeful, but the idea here is we can't fix ourselves. We can't change our sin nature. We can't change our identity. We can't change who we are, but our God can. And our God can and he will and he wants to change us from the inside out by the power of the gospel with his Holy Spirit. And this is the work he's been doing for thousands of years. And so today we're gonna look at a particular man's life who was changed radically, transformed radically by Jesus Christ. But before we do, let me just say this. A thousand years before Jesus, before the time of Jesus, the Israelites begged God for a king. And God said, well, I thought I was your king. And the people said, well, you kind of are, but we want to be like other nations. And so won't you give us a human king so we can be like the surrounding nations around us. And so God obliged and gave them a king. And this first king of Israel, his name was Saul. And Saul was tall and kind of had this kingly presence and everybody loved him. But the thing about Saul is he was arrogant and stubborn and proud and only partially faithful, partially obedient. And so Saul didn't trust in the Lord. And so God replaced Saul with someone new, a brave but humble man, a shepherd named David. Well, fast forward a thousand years, roughly, into the time of Christ, and there was another zealous religious leader also named Saul. But like the first king of Israel, Saul was also proud and arrogant, and he misunderstood the scriptures, and he missed the Messiah, and Saul didn't trust in, uh, in God, and so God replaced Saul with a new man, this New man would be brave, he would be courageous, and he would be humble, and uh, he was a spiritual shepherd of of sorts. Only this new man wasn't a different person, it was him. God so radically transformed Saul's life. In fact, from that point on, he became known as Paul or the Apostle Paul. He so transformed his life that virtually everything in his life, everything about him was turned upside down. And so we're going to look at his life today. And he tells a little bit of his story uh, with us um, in Galatians, the book of Galatians chapter one. We're going to pick it up here in verse 11. And here's what he writes. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach to you is not of human origin. I know that sounds very X-Files type stuff there, but not of human origin. Origin, And as we'll learn about Paul, the gospel isn't something that he would have invented. It's not something that he would have come up with. And again, that will make more sense as the message continues. Verse 12, he writes, I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. He's saying, look, I'm not giving this to you because I've received it from another person. No one told me this or taught me this. No one trained me this. Jesus himself revealed who he is to me very clearly. And by the way, believe me, I couldn't have come to this conclusion on my own. Now look at verse 13. This is great. For you have heard of my previous way of life. That's a key phrase for us, our previous way my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. Now, we'll get back to that a little bit later. Verse 14, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. So Saul was a very zealous young man. Uh, Young men tend to be very zealous and passionate. Sometimes they're very zealous and passionate about the wrong things. And Saul was just that. He was super zealous, but zealous about the wrong things. In the scriptures here, it says he was extremely zealous for the traditions of his father. So we're not talking about even the Old Testament commands. We're talking about the Jewish traditions that were placed on top of the Hebrew scripture, uh, the, the commands of the Old Testament. And the reality is, like Paul, we love our traditions, don't we? You know, we love uh, our traditions because we don't want to invalidate our personal experiences. 
So if we grew up in a church where we always sang hymns and played the organ, well, we would prefer that we sing hymns and continue playing the organ because to do something else makes it feel like, well, we're not being true to, you know, our faith. And the reality is our faith has nothing to do with playing the organ or singing certain songs. It has everything to do with Jesus. And this is the point that Paul is making as he's recalling his own personal testimony or sharing his testimony. He's saying, look, I was all about the wrong things, you know. I was all about the traditions. I was all about the side issues. I wasn't all about Jesus. And Jesus is the point. And so he was zealous for the traditions of his fathers. Now, what does it look like to be an extremely zealous young man in first century uh, Judea? Well, he gives us a glimpse in that verse when he says, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. And so Paul was, you know, at the top of his class. He had like great education. He was taught by one of the supreme uh, rabbis in that day. His name is Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was considered just super respectable among other rabbis. And, and so he was taught under, uh, under Gamaliel and received fantastic uh, 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 training by him. He studied under him. And, uh, and Paul was kind of at the top of his class. He was the kid that skipped a few grades. He was the, this is going to date myself, he was the Doogie Hauser of his time, right? He was just somebody who excelled in learning. And he, so he, Paul was very sharp. He was very studious. He was very devoted, very committed. But I think we get a much fuller picture of Paul's former life, his past life, and his zeal uh, uh, in Judaism uh, from this scripture in Philippians chapter 3 and starting in verse 4, just a couple verses here, he writes this, If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, in other words, reasons to put confidence in their fleshly external identity, in their uh, obedience or adherence to, you know, the law, then he writes this, I have more. So you think you've got confidence, I've got more. And then here's what he says circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regards to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church. Now, he mentioned that earlier in Galatians, but he says it again here in Philippians. As for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. And so Paul says, I have confidence, I've placed my confidence rather in the flesh. You think you've got a lot of confidence in the flesh? I've got even more. After all, I was circumcised on the eighth day. This is what the Old Testament told God's covenantal people to do is you're to circumcise all the little Jewish babies, you know, the Hebrew babies on the eighth day. And indeed he was, he kept all the laws. He did all the, went through all the religious ceremonies, you know, and he was of the people of Israel, it says, God's chosen nation. It goes on of the tribe of Benjamin. Now you might not know this, but that's an elitist statement. Because of the 12 sons of Jacob, only one was born in Canaan or only one was born in the promised land. And he guesses who that one would have been. Of course, yeah, it was Benjamin. And uh, the Benjamites had privilege. In fact, whenever there was a, a parade, the Benjamites would march in the front, right? They, were, they, they went out in front and ahead of people. And the first king of Israel came from the tribe of Benjamin. As we mentioned earlier, his name was Saul. He goes on to say he's a Hebrew of Hebrews. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means, one, he doesn't come from mixed blood. His mom was Jewish. His dad was Jewish. And, uh, but to be a Hebrew of Hebrews specifically meant that you continued to speak the Hebrew language. Other, uh, unlike other Hebrew uh, or Jewish families who began speaking the Koine Greek of that day and forgot about uh, the Hebrew language. No, they continued to learn Hebrew. So he was the Hebrew of Hebrews in regards to the law, a Pharisee. Now, the Pharisees were very devout, very serious, uh, very devoted, very strict group of religious uh, people who uh, made their life all about keeping all the laws. In that day, to be pious was to be um, exceptional, was to be almost like a celebrity among the Jewish people. And so to be a Pharisee was like a big deal. And Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was admired, in other words. He was 
among the upper class in first century Jewish society and culture. And he says this, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. In other words, he kept all the law. So you can see all the boxes that Paul is checking. And then he says, as for zeal, persecuting the church. And again, that's parallel to what he wrote in Galatians 1.13 when he says, my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church. This is not hyperbole. This is accurate because Saul, Paul, who was Saul, um, persecuted the church. In fact, he approved of the um, killing of the first Christian, at least the recording, first recording of the first Christian martyr. His name was Stephen. In Acts 8, 1, it says, and Saul approved of their killing him. Verse 3, it says, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And so the point here is Saul isn't saying, or Paul's not saying, look, one time I got in trouble for, you know, staying out past my curfew. One time I got busted for, you know, whatever. No, this is like serious stuff. He threatened the church. He pursued the church. He hunted the church. He sought to destroy the church. In 1 Timothy 1, he says, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, Paul is sharing his testimony. I used to be a violent person. I was a hateful person. I desperately desired to destroy the church. And who is the church? The church is the people of God. The church are the people who Christ died for. And I was the person hunting down uh, God's people, also called the bride of Jesus. You don't want to hunt down the bride of Jesus, but Paul was doing that his previous way of life. And again, he's just sharing his testimony. Paul had reached the highest heights in religious Judaism and religious superiority. Paul's reputation was undeniable. His commitment was indisputable, and he was absolutely committed, absolutely devoted to his cause of vanquishing this new Christian movement, these people who began pursuing and following Jesus Christ. He hated Jesus. He hated Jesus' followers, and he made it his life ambition, his goal to get rid of that movement, to do anything he could to crush, to stomp out the Christian movement. This was Paul's previous way of life. Uh, let me ask you, what is your previous way of life? How would you describe that? Everybody's got a story. Everybody's got a testimony. What's, what's your previous way of life? You know, once upon a time, I grew up going to church, and uh, I have good parents, and they took me to church. But really, before God totally got a hold of my heart, and I did all the, you know, the right things for the most part, you know, I was relatively moral. Um, my parents tell me that other parents loved having me you know, hang out with their son or be at their house because I would share the toys and I was just kind of easy to get along with. But I'll tell you this, I didn't love Jesus like I do today. I mean, not, not even close. Jesus was not a priority in my life. There were other things that were a greater priority. The Chicago Cubs, <laughs> the Chicago Bears, a lot of sports teams, my Washington Huskies. Later as I grew up, um, and excelled in sports and did different things. You know, I became kind of proud and arrogant in some of those things. And, and I'm not proud of, of that part of my life, but it is a part of my story. The point I'm making is that all of us have a story. Before God got a hold of our hearts, got a hold of our minds, we were like this. But now he's transformed us and is transforming us into someone new. And the good news of Jesus says this, no matter how morally good you think you are, you're not good enough. But it also says no matter how morally bankrupt you think you are, it's not greater than the grace of our God. And God is pursuing people, drawing them to himself, and not just so we go to heaven when we die. He wants to change us. He wants to transform us from the inside out. So that's Paul's testimony. That's, it. that's his previous way of life. And then he says in verse 15, but when God, I love those three words, but 
when God, and he goes on. I love that he didn't say, but when I met somebody, but when I went to youth camp, but when I went to church, but when I whatever. No, he says, but when God, and clearly there are circumstances that are a part of Paul's testimony, as we'll get into in just a moment here. But his emphasis isn't on the circumstances. It's on God. God got a hold of my life. God changed my life. And people have come and gone out of my life. But the Lord is the one who drew me to himself. And my life has never been the same ever since. Let me read you a little bit about his conversion story. It's found in the book of Acts chapter 9. It says this, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So if he found any there who belonged to the way, meaning the Christian movement, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. I mean, this is intense. This guy is on a mission hunting down Christians. Verse 3, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So, so Saul does just what Jesus tells him to do. He meets another follower of Jesus named Ananias. Ananias, so God heals uh, 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 Saul's vision. Now Saul can see. And then Saul is baptized, which is what we do when we come to faith in Christ. We identify with Jesus and his entire life was transformed. But when God, those three words, look what it continues to say in verse 15. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. I love this for a couple of reasons, but namely, did Saul, think about Saul's story. Did he do anything to deserve the grace of God? No, he did everything he could possibly do to not deserve the grace of God. Did he one day just like have this premonition or this experience and just like get on his knees? And No, God showed up to him in a very powerful and, and uh, awesome way, but it had nothing to do with anything Saul did. It was purely by the grace of God. And that's how grace works. Grace is a gift. Grace cannot be earned by definition. It's, it's a gift freely given, and God extends his grace to all people regardless of what we've done. He says, won't you just believe in me? Won't you just trust in me? I've taken care of your sin. I've paid for your sin. I've, I've defeated death through the grave. I've risen victoriously so you can live a victorious life. You can experience newness of life. Won't you place your faith in me? And he extends that to everyone, to the world. But he shows up to Saul in this very powerful way because he was a good person no because he was smart and impressive no because he was so passionate and so zealous no because why did he do only by the grace of God because that's just the character of our God he is a loving God he's a benevolent God he's a gracious God Paul did nothing to warrant or deserve his grace. You and I have done absolutely nothing to warrant or deserve the grace of God. And yet God still extends it to us. And I know this is difficult for us to understand because you know what we say? We say this, you get what you what? Deserve. You get what you deserve. But that's not the way God operates. God gives us what we don't deserve. And grace is this priceless gift that can never be earned, can never be deserved, can never be repaid, and he extends it freely to us. And when you experience that kind of gift, listen, it will dramatically transform your life. When you realize you've done nothing to warrant the favor of God, it will change you why? Because it, we can't help but respond with, wow, I'm so undeserving. I see myself more clearly for who I am. And it's not good, 
but I see you, God, more clearly for who you are, who is great and glorious and good. And I can't help but express with this amazement, that's astounding, that's astonishing. God, you are unbelievable. And that's the impetus for a transformed life. That's the motivation for a continued transformed life. Grace has a transforming power to it. Before my um, son Nathan and my daughter Elizabeth were born, I was going to love them, you know, no matter what. And if you're a parent, you've experienced this before. It doesn't matter what they do. Now, I will tell you this. Have they tested my love? Yes, they have tested my love and maybe still continue to do so on occasion. Well, they're great kids, but yeah, they test my love, but I'm still going to love them no matter how they treat me or respond to me. It's a father's love to a son, a father's love to a daughter. It's Mother's Day, so I should use a mother's example, a mother's love to a son or daughter. Now multiply that by infinity, and that is the love of our God. He will love you no matter what. You can run from him. You can reject him of your own free will, but God will never stop pursuing you this side of heaven. He loves you. He's after you. And grace demonstrates that none of this is about us. Listen, did you orchestrate the events of your life when you came to know Jesus, if you belong to Jesus? I'll tell you the answer is, of course you didn't. God worked through those circumstances. God worked through those, those people that he placed in our path at, at that time in our lives. God has always been active in our lives. And there came a moment like happened with the Apostle Paul when we just couldn't help. Our, our, the, the blindness of our eyes was lifted and now we could see God for who he is, at least more for who he is. And... Um, we received him into our lives and he received us into his life because of what he did. Well, it says this, but when God who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, I love this, was pleased, was pleased to do what? To reveal his son in me. Now, don't miss this. He talked about his previous way of life and then Jesus transformed or came into his life. Why? To reveal his son in me. So now the job description of every Christian is to demonstrate Jesus to the world, to share the good news of Jesus to the world, the, the hope of the gospel, to be dispensers of hope in this broken and dark and twisted and perverted and wicked and evil and lost world. That is our job. That's what it says here. God set me apart from my mother's womb. By his grace, he called me to reveal his son in me. And what I want us to see is that it wasn't like God just tweaked something in, in Paul's life. He didn't just adjust something, right? He didn't, you know, just give Paul like this inspirational pep talk, you know, and Get out there and just be better, you know? He didn't, he didn't just start listening to podcasts on positive thinking and self-help and self-actualization. No, it wasn't some small thing and it was nothing that Paul could do. It was something that God did and it was total and complete transformation to reveal Christ in him. And we see that throughout Paul's teachings in Philippians 3.8, he writes this, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, and I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Christ, what's comparable to Jesus, Paul would say? Nothing, right? What is Jesus to Paul? Answer, everything, everything. And everything else, I count it as loss. I, I consider it as garbage, as, as uh, rubbish, as just refuse, uh, just trash, right? There are countless things in this world that the world holds in high regard. Things that the world would say are important and should be important. And 
according to Paul, in comparison, if we're to make that comparison, in comparison to Jesus, everything that the world has to offer in comparison to Jesus is just like, it's like trash in comparison. That's how devoted Paul is to Jesus Christ. So he's transforming his heart. Look at verse 10 here in Philippians 3, just five words. I want to know Christ. Does that sound like obligation to you? Does that sound like duty to you, like I have to do this? No, it sounds like desire. It sounds like love. I want to know Christ. And so God gives Paul new eyes and he gives um, Paul a new heart and he gives Paul a new mind and he gives Paul a new power to live this new life and he gives Paul a brand new purpose to his life. You say, well, what, what's the new purpose that, Paul, uh, that God gives Paul? Well, it continues here and we'll just, this is the last verse, verse 16. He was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. The purpose of Paul's life was no longer to imprison God's people, imprison Christ's followers. It was to proclaim the good news of Jesus to the world, to the Gentiles, to those who hadn't heard of Jesus, hadn't seen Jesus, hadn't been with Jesus. I'm gonna pro proclaim this good news. Why would anybody listen to Paul? Well, Paul could tell his story. They might argue with some of the things he said, but they couldn't argue with his life transformation. Paul would say, listen, here's who I was, and I've got many people who can confirm who I was, but here's who I am now, because Jesus has changed my life. I want you to know that our God is the God who changes lives. And he did that 2,000 years ago. And guess what? He does that today. The evidence of life change is so abundant. Life change by Christ is so abundant in our world that no other philosophy, worldview, or religion can even come close to comparing with how many lives and the kind of life change that has happened among Christ followers. It is no small thing. It is no minor, meager uh, side thing. It is complete, total, internal, external transformation. This is the work that our God does because of what Jesus has done for us. I want to read you a little story here. Um, um, it's actually found in a book by uh, Lee Strobel. And in it, he talks about a guy by the name of Bill Moore. And Bill Moore grew up in poverty and, and got drunk. And one time, he shot another man for $5,000. As a result, uh, Bill was, of course, arrested. He was imprisoned. And then he was placed on death row. He had been there for some time when one day, a couple of people visited the prison and they would talk to different prisoners and share the good news of Jesus. And that particular day, they did so with, um, with Bill. Nobody had ever told Bill about Jesus before. He had been sitting on death row for years, but he listened to what they had to say and he turned his life over to Jesus Christ. In fact, it's said that it changed him so much it changed all the, the darkness, the hatred, the bitterness in his life into love and joy and peace. It changed him so much that other people began to be drawn to Bill. And so Bill began sharing Jesus with others on death row. It said that uh, his cell block was the safest cell block in the entire penitentiary because so many people were coming to Christ through Bill Moore. Well, guess what? Churches found out about this. And uh, when some people needed counseling, and this is not a joke, there were occasions when churches would direct them to Bill. Now, the only way to see Bill was to go visit the penitentiary. So imagine somebody calling the church for help, and the secretary or the pastor responds and says, hey, I know who, just who you need to talk to. <laughs> He's in a penitentiary but you need to hear his story and maybe he can encourage you. 
and counsel you. Well, Bill Moore was so changed that he won the love of the family over um, of the man that he had killed. And it changed him so much that over the 16 year, 16 year period, all kinds of people uh, wrote letters uh, on his behalf. Eventually, check this out, the authorities not only canceled his death sentence, they paroled him. This was unprecedented. And today, I believe, Bill serves as a, the head of a congregation of a couple housing projects in a desperately poor area. Well, he was asked, Bill, what in the world turned your life around? Was it medication? Was it counseling? Was it a new rehab program? And Bill said this, no, it was none of those, none of that stuff, he said. It was Jesus Christ. Can I tell you something? Atheism really has nothing to say to a man on death row. Jesus does. A life without God, atheism, has nothing to say to a human being, not just on death row, but on their deathbed. Jesus has a lot to say. Jesus is the transformer of lives, and he transforms us fundamentally in three areas. I'll just mention these quickly. Number one, God transforms our desires. He transforms what we want, if you can believe that. Some things that used to be important to me are just not as important today. Uh, some things that weren't important to me at all, I never thought when I was in high school or growing up, even my first year of college, that I would be a pastor today. But God changes our lives and he redirects our paths. And he does that not only in my life, he does that in your life as well. He transforms what you want. How does he do that? Because he transforms what's important to you. And you see now some things as being valuable and some things as being vulnerable, meaning you could take them or leave them. And ultimately, what is valuable? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus is everything. Jesus' mission, his purpose, his glory is everything to the person who belongs to him. And when Jesus, when God changes our values, then of course he's going to change our desires. He's going to change what we want. So God will change your uh, desires. Secondly, he will change your living. He will change your actions. He will change the choices you make, um, how you speak to people. You'll become slower to speak and quick to listen and slower to become angry. It's not that you'll become perfect, but you'll desire that God will increasingly perfect you. He will sanctify you. He will grow you in faith, but he will change the way you live, the decisions that you make on a daily basis. He will, he will rearrange your plans for the day because again, what you want is different and how you live will be different too. Didn't that change, or didn't that happen in Paul's life? We'll read a couple of verses here. Titus 2 says this, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we're instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. Yes, we live in a broken world, and a messed up world, but God will empower us to live with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to him. And so he changes the way that we live. And thirdly, God will transform your ambitions. He will change your goals. He will change your pursuits. He will change your priorities. And it's an amazing thing, you guys, but God... Uh, when he saves people, he leverages their abilities and their talents and their opportunities to bring glory to him. And uh, I just want to say, be open to that. How can God use you? There is nothing more powerful than the grace of God. There is no better news than the good news that God loves us so much that he came for us in Jesus, that he gave his life for us. He paid the price that we deserved and he rose victoriously so we could live a 
a champion's life, a victorious life in him. There's no better news than that. And our God is not about making people more religious, but he is about transforming our lives. How has God changed and transformed your life? How is he changing your life? You know, somebody said it this way. It's much easier to dismiss someone's words than it is someone's life. When our lives have been changed by Jesus, we can't help but be used by God for his purposes in this world. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what you crave? Isn't that what you desire? And guess what, friends? Even a pandemic can't hold down God's people and what he wants to do through us. So have hope, trust him, be faithful. And let me just say this. If you haven't placed your faith in Jesus before, I wanna urge you to do that today. I wanna urge you to say goodbye to your old life. Listen, the gospel has the power to change your present life into your previous life. Paul had a previous life and it was sordid. It was ugly. It was violent and aggressive and evil. But he transformed him in a remarkable way. Saul became Paul, who became the world's greatest missionary, wrote about two-thirds of the books in the New Testament. He's inarguably one of the top five most influential people who have ever walked the face of the earth. Now, that's likely not going to happen in our lives that same way, but profound impact will happen. God can take your present life and turn it into a previous life, and all it takes is you saying yes to King Jesus. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I live for myself. I know that I too often am the the king of my life. Lord, I want you to be my king. I want you to be my savior. I want all things to be considered as garbage, as trash in comparison to you. Will you enter into my life? Will you transform me from the inside out? Father, today I surrender my life completely to you. Forgive me. Make me new and equip me to do your work, your good and beautiful work, loving people in radical ways, sharing your good news in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to invite you to um, participate in our last worship song here. Uh, Andrew's going to lead us and... uh, Just even where you're at, you know, sing along. If you know this song, we got the words for you anyway. Sing along and join us as we worship our God together. Hey, Cedar Grove, let's take this moment and respond to the message. Let's sing.
So teach my song to rise to you When temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay When I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My Thank you so much for joining us today. If this message of transformation has resonated with you and you'd like to speak to someone about it, uh, fill out the online connection card and one of our team members will get back to you. Otherwise, we look forward to worshiping with you next week.